Hi and welcome back to a new video. About three months ago I was in this room together with Gamers Nexus Steve because he was visiting us here at Thermal Grizzly in Germany to do a factory tour to cover how we were making thermal paste, liquid metal and also parts of our mechanical production for water cooling blocks. And in one part of the video we ended up in this room which is our thermal paste testing room basically and also thermal interface materials in general. And then at that point in the video we knew that we already have too much video content. So we decided that we split this up and I'm covering this topic myself on the, on the channel right here, explaining how we are testing thermal paste and also discussing the entire thermal conductivity thing, which is a really difficult topic and something that is really important for you out there to figure out why these values, especially in thermal paste advertisement, are so irrelevant. Already in the early days of Thermal Grizzly, when we started to look into thermal paste, also thermal paste development, we figured out that developing a paste is one thing, but evaluating and testing it reliably is something completely different, because that is actually quite difficult. And then we were looking into, you know, the typical standard things in the industry, what kind of tim testers we could maybe acquire and buy and use, and how do they work? But then we quickly realized that this is nothing what we're looking for because they were too far away from what the customer in the end is expecting or is getting. So we decided to make our own thermal paste testers and the ones in the background you can see is basically our third iteration of the thermal paste of the team testers we're using internally. And we've spent years making them. As I said, this is the, like the third version of it. And if you might think of, you know, making it yourself is maybe also something cheaper not really the case. I mean, if you even neglect all the development work, just all the sensor stuff, like the measurement devices and building this, just a team tester like this will cost starting from 35,000 US dollars. And that is without all the development cost. That's why this thermal paste team tester is mimicking exactly this scenario. So what we have here on the bottom is a dummy heater. And this dummy heater right here has a surface of 30 by 30 millimeters, which is pretty much the same as any of the current CPUs that are on the market. We have some heating elements inside and it can produce up to 300 watts, while we're using usually 240 watts for our internal measurement. Then we have two temperature sensors. The one in the front is for control. The one in the back is for the measurement, for getting the data. Then we have a height sensor in here that is tracking the height to our top piece, which is this. That is basically just a big water cooling unit. It is the same as a traditional water block. We also made sure that we have roughly the same surface roughness, which is given right here, and also the surface roughness on the dummy heater on the bottom is equal to, to what you have on a current Intel or AMD CPU. And this height sensor has a precision of 0.2 micrometers, which is extremely precise. So the way it works is that we can lower this entire unit on the top we apply the thermal paste on the dummy heater on the bottom or like also a thermal pad for example. Then this will be lowered down and then a second unit is mounted on top and this will apply a defined pressure downwards. Then we have the control unit on the bottom where you can see that all the six channels from the heating elements are present on here where we can control the heat of each individual channel if we want to and also we have temperature sensors that I showed for the control and these temperature sensors are also important if we want to do temperature cycling tests. Temperature cycling testing is very important when it comes to any kind of thermal interface material for development and also to see how it performs long term. And for this, that's also a big difference to the typical industrial thermal paste tim testers that you can find, is that we can make our own dummy heaters. So for example, this one we made, and this one contains a GA102. So that is, if I remember correctly, a 3080 Ti. And with this one, we can just simulate the aging of our tim on a specific chip which is what you can't do with the typical, you know, if you buy, I don't know, some kind of other industrial thermal paste tim tester, then you can get one surface that might be copper and the other surface is also copper. Then you might be able to change that to maybe aluminum and aluminum, but you can't simulate exact scenarios like this. And that's why we, yeah, one big part why we made our own one. For you at home, the relevant factor is if you buy a thermal paste, you just want your CPU to be as cold as possible. And for that, we have five main factors that come into play. We divide this into internal and external factors. External factors, for example, is the surface area of your contact. So in our case, that's the 30 by 30 millimeters, which mimics roughly 
a current CPU and we use a heat flux of 240 watts for, for our measurements. That is, for example, equal to a 9950X under load. So I would say that's a quite realistic scenario. And then we have the internal factors, which are the factors of the thermal paste. And for that, you have, for example, the thermal conductivity. But to make it easier, we usually use the thermal resistance. And for the thermal resistance, we don't only have the thermal resistance inside the thermal paste, but it, we also have the contact resistance. So we have, first of all, the contact resistance between the CPU and the thermal paste, then the contact resistance betwe in between the thermal paste itself, and then again, a contact resistance between the, co uh, the thermal paste and your cooler. So those are internal factors. And the last internal factor that comes into play is the layer. Like how thick is your thermal paste applied under the mounted circumstance. It's not relevant how thick you apply it, like how much thermal paste you're putting on top, because once you're applying your CPU cooler and you press it down, all the pressure will push the thermal paste that is unnecessary out to the side. And the only thing that matters is how thick is the layer in between, in the end, between your CPU and the cooler. Now all those factors combined, bond line thickness, area, heat flux, and so on, they determine in the end the delta temperature, which is the only relevant thing for you at home. That's the only thing that matters. In an ideal scenario, the delta temperature would be zero. Like if you would have the perfect yeah, contact between a CPU and the cooler, which is physically obviously not possible. And even if it was a solid material, you would have a temperature delta inside the material. So that's not possible. So I think to make this easier, we will first just do one application of our current thermal paste and I will show you what kind of temperature delta we're seeing. Before we start, we have to do our reference quickly and that is closing everything, apply the pressure, which in our case is 270 newtons applied from the top. And for that, we also have to add the weight force of 30 newtons. That's basically the, the weight of this that is also pressing down in addition. So we have a total pressure of 300 newtons. Now we have to transition to our second tester, which we only use for pads and putty, but this also has to control the height control, the height measurement. And that is still the measurement from the previous run. And you know, there's always like, I don't know, temperature delta, temperature differences, whatever. So we have to zero this out, but currently this reads 0 0.006 millimeters. So we have to zero this. Anything we're doing with thermal paste and the height is determined in micrometers. If you don't know how much that is, if you take a millimeter and divide it by 1000, then you have a micrometer. And also to give you a feel of this, if you take a human hair and cut it on the cross section, you would have maybe 60 to 80 micrometers in diameter. That's what you have for human hair. But we want to look at height differences maybe of 5, 10, 20 micrometers. So this has to be extremely precise. So we're now re applying Durnaut thermal paste. Now, still without any mounting pressure, you can see the curve here, how the 30 newtons of weight force are compressing the paste. And still, even without any force, we are already at only 0.25 millimeters, so that's 250 uh, micrometer of layer. So now, force is applied, it is pressed down. And now we measure a bond line thickness of 12.6 micrometers. That is the layer now in between our dummy heater and the water block, which is extremely thin. And that basically also perfectly aligns with what Igor measured when he was testing our paste. He also had a bond line thickness of 12 micrometers, so that the minimum possible layer thickness. So I would say that perfectly aligns with his testing, even though we have a nine times larger contact surface. As far as I know, he is measuring with 10 times 10 millimeter surface area, and we are measuring with 30 by 30 millimeters um, surface area. And the thing is, the higher your surface area becomes, the more likely it is that you also have maybe a tiny little bit of bigger particles inside. It's just Gaussian distribution, and yeah, that's still actually, that's perfectly where we want to be. Now we're switching this on. So all the six channels are active and it's running with 40 watts under load, so that equals 240 watts. We have a pump on the left that is now also actively pumping water through our water block. And this is going inside this reservoir, which is 25 liters to just have as little temperature differences as possible. And then after this, we have an industrial chiller to control the water temperature as well. Now, after a couple of minutes in testing, we can see the test result right here. The top temperature, 35.8 degrees Celsius, that is the heater on the bottom. 
The bottom temperature 6.44, that is the delta. The delta between the heater and the water cooler that is sitting on top and that determines our performance. This delta value combines all the relevant information. It combines the heat flux, the layer thickness and also the thermal conductivity for example. And now the thing is, how do you develop a thermal paste to make it even better? You can think of increasing the thermal conductivity. For example, if we would take this thermal paste as a base and if we were able to double the thermal conductivity, we were in theory able to cut this value in half. So we would divide it from 6 to 3. But what we could also do is we could cut the bond line thickness into half. So go down from 12 micrometers to 6 micrometers, it would have exactly the same result, just theoretically speaking. In reality it's a little bit different, but just theoretically speaking. So then when we started developing a thermal paste at Thermal Grizzly, we quickly realized that just tweaking the thermal conductivity itself is quite difficult. At least we reached a point where we are reaching physical boundaries. It's pretty difficult to increase it further. But what is from our perspective much easier to tweak is the bond line thickness. So the minimum layer thickness that is possible to apply your thermal paste. Because if we would go down from the 12 micrometers to 6 micrometers, we would also cut this value in half. And that's also my issue I have with how Igor is measuring thermal paste. And it's not me trying to stab him in the back, you know, he knows that I talked with him about this multiple times, so it's not a secret or anything. But you can see that in his charts, all the values start from 25 micrometers onwards. So all the areas below 25 micrometers, he doesn't take into account when you're looking at the minimum uh, thermal paste layer or like the bond line thickness. In this chart, we can see how Igor is measuring the minimum layer thickness and Duranaut achieves 12 micrometers. If we're looking at the TC5888, which is doing really good in Igor's measurements, we can see it has a minimum layer thickness of 20 micrometers. This means that the TC5888 would have to have 66% higher thermal conductivity to match the real world performance of the Duronaut thermal paste, which it's not. Because if you look at just the bulk thermal conductivity, they differ in 5%. And the effective thermal conductivity, they differ in 23%. So if you would apply both in a delta measurement, this paste will give you a lower delta. You would see a lower CPU temperature. I totally understand why Igor is measuring how he's measuring, because he wants to compare a big field of pace, so he's starting at a certain point. But he's starting at 25 micrometers. And you can imagine that if you have a CPU and a cooler on top, there is not a defined layer of 25 micrometers in between. In an ideal world, or even if the CPU is in a very good condition, you would have a lot of areas where the cooler will directly contact the CPU. The direct contact points are the points of the best heat transfer. And on those locations, only the surface roughness is relevant. So if you have tiny gaps in between, those are the gaps you want to fill with the thermal paste. Now, if you have a thermal paste with bigger particles and that have, in theory, a better thermal conductivity, you will move CPU and cooler further apart, which will lead in worse performance. There's also a good example that makes this a little bit more clear. If you're thinking about deleted CPUs, we have the chip, and then we have an indium sheet on top that is usually between 300 to 400 micrometers uh, thick. And this has a thermal conductivity of about 80 watts per meter Kelvin. And we're replacing this with liquid metal. And liquid metal, if you measure it, has a thermal conductivity between 20 and 30 watts per meter Kelvin. This means we're actually replacing the indium with something that is three to four times worse in terms of thermal conductivity. But the layer, will be a lot thinner. Because liquid metal is just a liquid, it doesn't contain solid particles. Well, that's only in theory. In the real world, you have tiny bits here and there, so it might be something between one and three micrometers uh, bond line thickness for the liquid metal. But that is what gives you this insane performance increase. Even though you're going down in thermal conductivity, because you're lowering the, the layer so drastically, you have such a huge performance increase. For a real world example, we're now changing to our Putty Pro. And I also sent this to Igor a while ago and he was testing this with a thermal conductivity of 7.4 watt per meter Kelvin. And that is roughly twice as much as what he measured with Duronaut thermal paste. So if we would just go by the thermal conductivity, if we would apply it to this again, remember we had about 6.4 degrees Celsius difference before, 
then we should improve this, right? Because this is much better thermal conductivity. If we're now going back to check the bond line thickness of this, we can see 0.23 millimeters, which is about 18 times as much as with the Duranaut thermal paste. And we're starting the run again. Now, after a couple of minutes, we see a delta of 11.4 degrees Celsius. And that is kind of interesting, right? Because it's twice as thermally conductive as Duranaut, but it's almost twice as bad. And that is simply because of the increased layer thickness. That is because the particles inside a putty are just much larger, because the purpose of the putty is something completely different. It is to fill a bigger gap. And for this gap filling, bigger particles are just much better, because they have a better thermal conductivity. But because they increase the layer thickness, they also lead to a worse delta, as you can see here. So if you would apply this to a CPU, you would have much worse results than before. And that proves exactly the point that if you're just looking at the individual values of thermal conductivity, thermal resistance, or even the bond line thickness, if you just look at the individual values, it doesn't tell you anything. It doesn't help you. You might get misled a lot. And that's what I'm seeing what's going on. Like all this advertisement values I'm seeing nowadays, you know, you go to Amazon, you see liquid metal advertised for 120 watt per meter Kelvin, which is physically impossible. It's purely misleading all of you customers. The only thing that is relevant is the temperature delta. The only value that takes all the aspects into account. I also want to highlight that this is not to bash Igor. The measuring that he's doing is not wrong. It's just looking at a different aspect. He's taking a look at different scenarios and that's fine. It's not technically wrong. It's just not as helpful as I think what you're looking for. If you're looking for the best paste or for the best product out there, only the temperature delta for you will matter. And I will also want to highlight, you know, if you're reading stuff like there is a new thermal paste or new liquid metal out there that will improve it by this much, then you should lower your expectations. Because you can see with a very high end paste, in a realistic scenario, you have a delta of six degrees Celsius. If we would apply a liquid metal here, the delta is around four degrees Celsius. So the thing between a liquid metal and a thermal paste, there is about 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius left in theoretical improvements that are possible. And I think that's not really, or that's not realistically going to happen because the amount of money you would have to invest into such a thermal paste, it would be ridiculously high. So you would have to pay for a very expensive thermal paste to not even get the performance of liquid metal you won't reach it, it's not possible. So whenever somebody tells you, you know, this paste is, I don't know, 10 degrees Celsius better than the other, very, very unlikely. Make sure you check the video from Gamers Nexus and I hope you enjoyed this video. See you next time, bye-bye.